thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, what we're going to do, uh, spend a little time with you again today, is going through what I think are three bills. I'm not sure if there's more than that, but there, there are three in, in, on my radar screen. Um, H51, H175, and H214, I believe, um, are bills that have been introduced that deal with um, fossil fuel infrastructure. No, mass like magic. Those are the three bills. Um, and since there's been a lot of uh, discussion in the hallways of this building about this, um, you know, before we dig too much deeper into the session, I wanted Luke to take us through um, these bills, have the committee have an opportunity to ask questions um, about the direction that uh, each of these bills takes. Um, I guess that's it by way of introduction. Great. So, thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the record, Luke and Martin Land from Legislative Council. And as the chair indicated, uh, the purpose of our discussion today is go over these bills in committee. But what I thought I would do is begin with a little background on um, some of the issues you've heard so far uh, from other witnesses, just refresh your recollection. And then um, talk about some issues that you may want to consider as we go through the bills and then walk through those bills. And uh, as always, if you have questions, please ask. If anything I say is not clear, please ask. So uh, there's two existing pipelines in Vermont, the Vermont Natural Gas Pipeline that you heard testimony about, I think a few weeks ago, in the western part of the state from Canada down to the uh, middle part of the state. And then there's also a Portland Pipeline Corporation pipeline in the Northeast Kingdom that goes from Portland, Maine up to Montreal that transports, I think it's crude oil, from Portland up to Montreal. So those are the two existing pipelines in Vermont at this point. What I'd like to do today is, as I said, give you a background on the existing law so you understand the existing regulatory framework that pertains to fossil fuel pipelines and facilities, and then briefly summarize some decision points and then walk through those bills. So a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, when you're talking about the existing regulatory framework, it's important to distinguish between the federal and the state. And you heard testimony about this a few weeks ago, about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. FERC regulates <coughs> interstate, in other words, between the states, wholesale sale and transportation of electricity and natural gas. And FERC also has jurisdiction over the construction of interstate natural gas pipelines and storage facilities. <coughs> this is a federal area that you cannot pass legislation that impacts you'd be preempted from doing so. As to within the state, it's important to distinguish between natural gas and other types of fossil fuels. As I'll go through in a moment, the Public Utilities Commission, through the Certificate of Public Good process, regulates uh, some natural gas pipelines. Act 250 could apply to other fossil fuel pipelines or facilities. So it's important to keep separate in your mind, federal, interstate, state, natural gas, and other forms of fossil fuels. Now, as far as the regulatory framework for natural gas, this is set forth in 30 BSA 203, which states that the Public Utility Commission and the Department of Public Service have jurisdiction, and then it lists those areas they have jurisdiction over. And it includes a company engaged in the manufacture, transmission, distribution, or sale of gas or electricity to the public, or under two, that part of the business of a company, which consists of the manufacture, transmission, distribution, or sale of gas or electricity to customers. In addition, under 30 BSA 248, and this is a long statute, I'm just going to summarize two parts of it. It states that no company may in any way begin site preparation for or commence construction of any natural gas facility except for the replacement of existing facilities with equivalent facilities 
in the usual course of business unless the Public Utility Commission first finds that the same promote the general good of the state and issues a certificate to that effect. In other words, a certificate of public good. It's important to see the definition under A, which is paraphrased above, which states that a natural gas facility means any natural gas transmission line, transmission line, not necessarily distribution line, transmission line, storage facility, manufactured gas facility, or other structure incident to any such line. In other words, any such transmission line. <coughs> the definition continues, for purposes of this section, natural gas transmission line shall include any feeder main or any pipeline facility constructed to deliver natural gas in Vermont directly from a natural gas pipeline that could be between the states. So this is an important definition it's important to keep in mind that as to natural gas facilities and transmission lines, the PUC has jurisdiction before any of those could be built. <coughs> but there is the exception that the replacement of an existing facilities with equivalent facilities in the usual course of business. <coughs> so is that law and that definition clear to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the definition of national gas uh, transmission line, in, including any feeder main or any mm -hmm. pipeline facility constructed to deliver natural gas in Vermont directly from or to, because a feeder line implies to me that it's feeding into a transmission, any uh, uh, feeding into a pipeline. The, the full sentence, I, I cut it off at the bottom of the frame here, but it says um, feeder main or any pipeline facility constructed to deliver natural gas in Vermont directly from a natural gas pipeline facility that has been certified pursuant to then there's a citation to federal law. Oh, okay. So, so we're talking about from a natural gas pipeline facility, which is either a generation or... Well, think of it as a natural gas um, supply pipeline from outside of Vermont okay. Okay. coming into Vermont, and then there's okay. uh, the connection to Vermont and ultimately to the customers. Okay. Okay. Is there any confusion about um, whether a pipeline that is bringing gas from out of state is an in-state line or an interstate line? So, no, I don't believe so. So if it's bringing gas from out of Vermont, let's say from another state, that's within the jurisdiction, the construction is under the jurisdiction of FERC. So that would be an interstate so natural gas line. If the, line physically crosses a state boundary then it's interesting. If it's coming from another state, yes. Yeah. If it's coming from somewhere else, coming into but Vermont. The gas inside the pipeline in Vermont is from another state. You see what I'm saying? Right, so the Public Utility Commission would regulate the um, construction of a natural gas facility inside Vermont, which is defined to include a pipeline inside Vermont. Is, yeah. Well, line. so uh, I guess I mean, is it, maybe there's a facility or some sort of some sort of a distribution structure or something. Once the pipeline crosses the border or in, yeah, into Vermont, in, into Vermont, um, what I'm asking is uh, whether there's whether it's just it's just me or there's any confusion about whether a pipeline is, that is constructed in Vermont but it's actually mm -hmm. carrying interstate gas. I I think it is is an is an in state facility an in state pipeline or an interstate pipeline. I, I don't think so because I think it's um, and, and there might I might be mistaken about this. I think it's dependent on the pipeline, not the gas inside the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So yes, could gas come from outside Vermont? Sure. Right. But when you're talking about a certificate of public good for construction of a pipeline, you're talking about the physical pipeline, that's yeah. What determines whether the PUC would have a jurisdiction or not? If the FERC has not tried to assert, well, they right. would assert it between right. the states, yeah. okay. and they also control the wholesale market. But um, once it crosses into Vermont, the PUC would have jurisdiction if you're constructing the pipeline in Vermont. Right. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, I think that the distinction in the, in a previous slide is. I forget the wording, but uh, that the that the, the pipeline is 
on bringing gas to customers in Vermont, as opposed to the pipeline that crosses the corner of the Northeast Kingdom, right. which is just right. uh, That's not, not serving any retail right. sure. customers. It's a wholesale, I think, was the I forget the wording, but that's right. that's a distinction. That's a good point. Thank you. Would um, methane be considered natural gas? I don't believe it is. I, I don't know if there's some, you know, technical definition of what distinguishes. I don't. It, I, I'm, I should say I'm not sure. Okay, I can check and get back to you. Any other questions? So this is the regulatory framework as to natural gas pipelines and facilities. Now, as to other fossil fuels, and the pipeline you mentioned, or referenced earlier, is actually not natural gas, that's oil from Portland up to oh, Montreal. Okay. So remember that to fall within Act 250, so Act 250 is separate from the Public Utilities Commission, to fall within Act 250, a project must involve either more than a 10 acres of land or more than one acre of land within a municipality that doesn't have zoning and subdivision bylaws. That's the general standard for Act 250. Now, a pipeline could fall within this definition. And an example is a pipeline in the Northeast Kingdom from Portland, Maine, up to Montreal. Uh, the, uh, there wasn't actually an Act 250 um, case uh, concerning that. And the Natural Resources Board uh, ruled that the pipeline could satisfy this requirement because the whole length of the pipeline was more than uh, 10 acres and parts of it uh, were more than an acre within various municipalities that didn't have the zoning and subdivision bylaws. So the pipeline could have been subject to Act 250. In that case, the Natural Resources Board held it ultimately wasn't because it had been constructed prior to the passage of Act 250, going back to the 40s and 50s and then been updated in, I think, the early 60s. So in that case, that pipeline was not within Act 250, but a new pipeline to carry fossil fuels could perhaps fall within the Act 250 uh, structure and could therefore be subject to Act 250 review. Yes. So on that particular pipeline, um, <clears throat> there was some controversy a few years ago about whether to reverse the flow mm -hmm. uh, from Montreal down to Portland yep. in order to carry uh, Tar sands, oil. Yep. and would would a change like that uh, trigger Act 250 review? Well, that's exactly what I'm referring to. The decision said no, because the decision no. held that um, it was it was a type of um, fuel. I forget the word that was used, but it's also whether it needed to be upgraded the pipes or the um, valves. And the uh, Natural Resources Board held that those were um, not sufficient to within Act 250. Mm -hmm. So you're right, that was a claim. It was rejected by the Natural Resources Board. Under a different claim, maybe the facts would be different. Mm -hmm. Now there is an exception under Act 250 that carves out um, natural gas facilities that fall within the jurisdiction of the PUC. So if you're natural gas, you're under PUC, another fossil fuel pipeline might be under Act 250, you probably wouldn't fall within both. To be either or. So, with that background, are there any questions about that before I proceed? Here's some issues or decision points you should be aware of when we go through the various bills, because each of them approaches this issue in a different way. So, very high level, um, you have an option to include do nothing, maintain the status quo, what I call the absolutes, which could be arguably to ban all fossil fuel pipelines in the state, or for that matter, perhaps remove all restrictions, or modify the existing criteria, for example, under the Public Utilities Commission, to either encourage or discourage construction of fossil fuel facilities and pipelines. If you're taking this third option, which is looking at the criteria, there's various things to be aware of when we go through the bills. First of all, the distinction between facilities and pipelines. We've been talking about pipelines, and I think that's how most people envision this issue. but what kinds of other facilities potentially could be impacted. Um, what I made clear about natural gas and other fossil fuels, <coughs> addressing one, the other, both. And various carve-outs, that could be a grandfather clause for existing facilities, maybe they wouldn't be covered by the bill, or maintenance. So you get various carve-outs that 
if you're modifying the criteria, would pull out certain types of pipelines or facilities from those changes to the criteria. So I'd now like to begin to go through the bills, but before I do that, I think I should yeah. sure. clarification uh, about, could you describe natural gas facilities versus pipelines? What, what, sure. what would be a facility? Well, I'll go back to the definition that we went through earlier, and I am not an engineer, so I don't know if I can you know, give you a on the ground definition. But if you remember from, um, where was it? So from 30 BSA 248, that's the definition of natural gas facility. And it says any natural gas transmission line, storage facility, manufactured gas facility, or other structure incident to any such line or facility. And then it goes on with the language we talked about with the feeder from the interest in line. So it's not just the pipeline, but storage and other structures or facilities that are incident to that pipeline. Are there natural gas storage facilities? I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. You mean inside Vermont, I assume? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, a manufactured gas facility, I guess, would be a, a, a methane digester or a, a landfill, landfill. I'm not sure. Is it a facility? Does anybody know? Are, there any, friend here. are yeah. there any other? I, I believe that's reference to the, the okay. legacy, uh, like the Barge Town, from, Tom Murray from Vermont Gas, by the way. That's a reference to the legacy manufactured gas, which was uh, uh, Rutland had one and Barry had one, uh, basically manufacturing uh, gas from coal, uh, coal, coal sludge, basically. Uh -huh. And that's, okay. that's where that really is a reference to. Uh -huh. And on the note around facilities, uh, we have gate stations along the way that do decreases the transmission pressure down to distribution pressure. So that would be ancillary to right. the transmission right. line. So that allows us to serve a community at a lower pressure. So, right. Right. No, no, thank you. Uh, so are there any facilities um, where a pipeline crosses into Vermont? Or really the only facilities, so what I'm getting from your answer, the only facilities are, uh, are, are the pressure facilities to decrease the pressure from transmission to distribution. Yeah, so that, I mean, we have true? a couple of mainline valves, which is a, a similar, but it's a small station for, for a, a, a release pressure or something like that. But the, in general, the gate station is really the, the, the big one that we see on the transmission line um, related to that. Um, we do have a propane air plant, which is a way to <laughs> make propane and to make natural gas. That's a, that's a uh, peaking uh, unit. That would probably be considered ancillary because that yeah. is used during cold days to inject into the system. That's the only thing that's even close to a storage facility in Vermont. I will say Omia has an LNG facility, uh, which is a uh, you know the, the mine down in Florence. They have an LNG facility that um, I don't know. It's physically classified as storage, but it definitely is a, has the look and feel of storage. Not associated with a transmission facility, but I do believe they got 248 for it when they got that uh, permit. Okay, great, thank you. So um, before we go into this, I want to actually um, back up to a question that Scott had asked earlier uh, that I'm not sure I'm entirely clear on, which is um, at what juncture the jurisdiction of the PUC kicks in relative to the jurisdiction of FERC. So um, if we have a pipeline that crosses a state border, mm -hmm. um, and an expansion on that pipeline is looking to be completed. Mm -hmm. uh, is that an expansion of an interstate facility and therefore is under <coughs> is under FERC jurisdiction? So your pipeline that comes to the border of Vermont and stops or continues into Vermont? Uh, continues into Vermont. Okay. If, it, if there is a pipeline crossing a into border Vermont, into Vermont yeah. or going the other way too, but coming into Vermont, um, and an expansion of that pipeline is um, is anticipated or is, is uh, looking to be um, uh, uh, supported, construction that looking to be supported, is it FERC jurisdiction or is it PUC? If it's in, well, actually let's back up and make yeah. it simpler. Um, so you have a pipeline, some company builds a pipeline in New Hampshire, other than turn to Vermont. Um, Vermont Gas wants to tap into that and have a pipeline into Vermont to yep. serve Vermont customers. Sure. BUC. Okay. Okay. BUC jurisdiction. Even though it crosses the border? Well, in, in what's within Vermont. Vermont oh. regulates what's inside Vermont. FERC regulates 
outside Vermont between the states. So right, so wherever the pipeline comes from is in New Hampshire, stops at Vermont border, Vermont Gas wants to now build a pipeline from the Vermont border into Vermont, serve customers in Middlebury, PUC, okay? So say you already have that pipeline inside Vermont, serving the customers in Middlebury, um, and they want to somehow extend it further. That might depend on whether it's a transmission line, how it's defined, how far it goes. I don't know if I can give you an exact answer. <coughs> you see, could definitely be involved depending on, on the nature of that ex expansion. Yeah, what's not clear to me is uh, um, does FERC have any jurisdiction over construction? Inside Vermont? Well, I'm looking at your very first slide. Okay. Uh, um, actually, that's page three. FERC regulates interstate wholesale sale and transportation yep. of electricity and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Jurisdiction of, over construction of interstate mm -hmm. natural gas pipelines and storage facilities. Okay. So in your example of the pipeline that goes to Lebanon, New Hampshire, okay. and stops there, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's an interest in um, Vermont connecting up, at the NT in Vermont connecting up with that pipeline yep. and bringing that pipeline into the mm -hmm. state. That would seem like uh, FERC would have a lot to say about whether that construction goes forward or not. Within Vermont? Okay. I don't believe so. I believe, you know, FERC is concerned with the wholesale market, electricity and natural gas, concerned with the construction of interstate natural gas pipelines. Yep. Um, but uh, Vermont Gas applies to build the pipeline from Lebanon into Vermont to serve Vermont customers. Yeah. I believe that is just PUC. Okay. I do not believe FERC has a role in that. Now, there might be yeah. some scenario that, I don't know, where okay. they would be involved, but I can't think of it. I don't know if anyone else I, I, the, 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 you know, I'd have to go back to you, but when we talked about going to the international paper plant, um, we were we got a 248 permit to, or we, we worked to get a 248, I think this final permit mm -hmm. was never issued because the project died, but essentially we were going down the path of the 248, uh, really from Middlebury to the lake, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, FERC was permitting, I think, the lake crossing, because that's when it tripped into the interstate, okay. essentially. So I think that's kind of the distinction there. I do believe, though, that FERC um, often defaults to the, the state's environmental regulation mm -hmm. to a large extent, and um, so, uh, you know, but I think the long and the short of it is uh, any any pipeline, uh, if somebody tried to use the FERC uh, trump card to really trump, uh, that's probably a bad analogy, but maybe it's appropriate, actually, um, <laughs> to do something like that in Vermont. I think Vermont would have a, a pretty extensive say. You've seen that in New York, uh, that the, the governor of New York effectively jammed the pipeline project uh, from Binghamton to Albany. Um, and even though it was a FERC project, they've essentially stopped that part project. So FERC for could not force through a pipeline that the PUC did not issue a certificate of public good for. I'm not an attorney, but I believe but the states can make life very difficult for a yeah. more a, uh, pipeline. If that's what you're trying to get to. It, well, the reason I'm asking that is we're about to go into these bills, yes. and I want to yep. be clear. You know what kind of um, you know what kind of jurisdiction and sure. playing field the legislature has on, on some of these uh, well, issues because yes. you know they're, they're you know they're, these are intra, you know in, interstate. Well, I, I think the bills are all um, legal. I, I think that they all uh, are focused on Vermont. You see there's language to make yeah. sure, carve out for FERC, I think, in this bill. So we cover ourselves double, but I think they're all okay. I don't think they'll raise those issues. So this is now H51. So I talked to you earlier about some uh, decision points or things to be aware of. Um, H51 is a bill that would fall in the category of what I call the absolutes. In essence, it would ban the um, any new fossil fuel pipelines in the state. And so let's walk through it, and please, if there's any questions, I don't plan to read it word for word, but if there's any questions, please stop me and let me know. So you have section one is purpose, and as you know, that's in session law. It doesn't really have a uh, direct legal impact, but it sets forth the goal the General Assembly for the reason why you would be considering this bill. And it has some general language about the reason for what Section 2 does. So Section 2 is adding a new subchapter, and it's actually in Title 29, 
which uh, chapter 14 deals with natural gas and oil conservation. And that title actually has intent language of its own, <coughs> which states that Vermont should encourage natural uh, gas and oil exploration and development. Um, so this would add a new subchapter <coughs> 9, and it states that in line 4 under A, a person shall not construct or reconstruct fossil fuel infrastructure in the state. So it's a prohibition on the construction or reconstruction of fossil fuel infrastructure. In other words, it's an absolute ban. One is a carve out, in essence, for FERC to make sure that there's no conflict. Two says that the prohibition does not include the repair or maintenance or both of fossil fuel infrastructure in existence. In other words, the grandfather clause. Like I mentioned earlier, it's a carve out for existing pipelines or facilities. Under B, it has definitions. And so it gives a definition of fossil fuel. And interestingly, there's only one other definition of fossil fuel I'm aware of in the Vermont statutes, which sort of lists all the types of fossil fuel. So this would be a new definition, and it's a definition that we reuse in many of our bills. I'm presuming methane would not be included in this. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba. No, it was methane from decayed organic matter, but I guess it's not near its crust, so good point. Uh, B, as used in the section two, fossil fuel infrastructure means a structure and ancillary facilities used to move fossil fuel from one location to another, such as a natural gas or oil pipeline. The phrase includes natural gas facilities defined in Title 30, which is the definition I gave you earlier. So it covers, oh, I'm sorry. So it covers, my apologies. Um, covers uh, natural gas and other fossil fuels. Now, under the second sentence, it states that the phrase does not include and then it lists motor vehicles, underground tanks, or pipes located in the site of a service station, or pipes leading to a residence or commercial building. So this is another kind of car map. Doesn't include your cars, doesn't include uh, gas station, doesn't include a residential commercial building in a fuel tank. Is that clear? So, so in layman's terms, mm -hmm. I'll ask you, what does it include? It includes uh, And is it really just Vermont gas, basically? No, I, oh. I think it would be, I mean, yes, it would include Vermont gas, a new pipeline, not okay. an existing one. Okay. Remember there's that car valve. Um, it is structure and ancillary facilities move to use fossil fuel from one location to another. So it would be very similar to the current definition that we talked about, the pipeline and the um, gates or whatever so words you use that's necessary to move the oil or gas. That's what it would include. Um, I don't know what you're but thinking like, of. I'm, frankly, I'm thinking of his, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of Bourne's in Morseville. I'm sorry, They're moving, Bourne's company, you know, they're sorry, it's no, no, fuel oil company, okay. you know, gotcha. the home delivery and oh, okay. delivery. Yeah, I don't think it would include that. I don't think so. I don't, I don't know okay. where, it, if they get a, pro, if they would want to build a new pipeline to service some storage yeah. facility, then it That's might involve a pipeline from the existing facilities. No, that'd be grandfathered out from their trucks that they're transporting uh, no, fuel fun. to the storage tank for the local residents. No, I don't think it would include that. But what about um, a, uh, a pipeline going into Addison County that currently doesn't serve a particular uh, town or neighborhood that wants to hook into that for, um, uh, you know, for, for residential use? Um, so it would be an extension like to get to a new house? Well, and I, new, uh, you know, I, I guess, the, the, yeah, essentially, but um, I'm trying to distinguish between um, what this bill would allow, and maybe we're not at that section yet, but between, um, uh, I guess what I'll call um, transmission and distribution. Yep. yep. Um, and by transmission, I mean uh, maybe the larger uh, diameter pipe that uh, is is supplying a particular area under as pressure. A, yeah. under high pressure. Maybe that's a well, way to distinguish it, as opposed to um, distribution where a neighborhood or an individual home is being 
Yeah. Well, the way it's defined, I think it would include both. Yeah. Um, and if you're taking up the bill, that might be an issue that you deal with. But the definition, remember, means structured to move fossil fuel from one location to another. Yeah. It doesn't distinguish between transmission, distribution, or pressure or diameter. So it seems to include both types of lines. Um, do trains count as motor vehicles, or is that simply? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Um, or is it simply oh, got more semi trucks? <laughs> good question. Or yeah. That's the kind of thing you can take up the bill. You can clarify. Any other questions about the definitions? So, in section three, and if I forget the page down, please remind me. So basically what section 3, section 4, and section 5, and for that matter section 6 do, is each of them has a prohibition on the construction or approval of any new pipeline. So um, section 3 states that the Secretary of A&R cannot approve, um, a per can, I'm sorry, cannot issue a permit or other approval pertaining to the construction or reconstruction of a fossil fuel infrastructure. Section four basically deals with Act 250. Um, section five states that uh, municipal uh, land use permit cannot be issued for the construction or reconstruction of a fossil fuel infrastructure. So each of these are prohibitions on any body or person approving the construction or reconstruction of fossil fuel infrastructure. Section six is now in Title 30, so this is dealing with the Public Utilities Commission, I will move it in a second. Yep. You want to go down, I assume, to section six? Yep, okay. Um, so what this does is, I'm gonna switch pages here, but it's Title 30, and this is the same uh, law that we looked at earlier, 248. And the new language, so it keeps existing law, but you see the new language on lines five through seven basically states that, commencing with the effective date, the commission, the Public Utility Commission, cannot issue a certificate of public good as to a natural gas facility. So on paper, they would have that continuing authority, but they can't ever issue a CPG as to a natural gas facility. Continuing down, I'm not gonna read these, starting on line eight, U of A, these are stylistic changes, just updating the drafting convention. They're not substantive. And then continuing down, <coughs> You see that certain language is removed, and I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> the existing language is lined out, and under existing law, the PUC um, <coughs> can at its discretion have a proceeding to give an opinion that might be relevant to uh, a FERC proceeding. But um, this will remove the ability to do so. Later on, under I, I'm sorry, one and two under H, it again strikes out, let me go back up so you can see it. Um, if there is a proceeding for a federal certification, um, uh, under existing law, the PUC, uh, in essence, can give its input, but now this law will mandate that the input would be that the facility is contrary to the general good of the state. So it's requiring the POC to be negative as to such an application proceeding. And then you'll see that one and two would be deleted from current law. And basically what this is doing is that the POC would not have a role in giving advice to, to FERC about an interstate pipeline if it somehow went back to Vermont, and that the POC could not approve any new fossil fuel <coughs> pipelines or facilities in the state. One other definitional thing, maybe it's yep. a definitional thing that um, is mentioned here a couple times. <coughs> I want to be clear on um, the the, uh, the phrase construction or reconstruction. Yep. And um, back up it's on page three of the bill, mm -hmm. uh, line four, a person shall not construct or reconstruct mm -hmm. fossil fuel infrastructure in the state. And then it goes on to say what the prohibition does not include. When I think of reconstruction of fossil fuel infrastructure, 
uh, in my mind, that falls in the in the maintenance world. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also uh, in 851. Maintenance is carved out. Um, so I'm trying to juxtapose those things. Uh, reconstruction is is this is a carryover bill. Um, you could I think you could use a different word than reconstruction. It's not a defined term in the bill. So if, if you want to, uh, thank you very much. If you wanted to use a different word, I think that'd be fine. I think you're trying to get at um, building a new or is somehow substantially changing an existing, so it's not merely maintenance. Okay. I believe that's what you're trying to get at, but we could define it better. Um, I think it's also important to know that on page five. Well, thank you very much. Um, Line eight, this this uh, section about mm -hmm. natural gas transmission line, and, mm -hmm. and natural gas tra transmission line is, is defined as, mm -hmm. as, as, as I think a, to be distinct from a distribution line. Um, at least that's how I took it. I read it. I, I think I think you're right. Yep. Yeah. So so uh, uh, back on page three, where the new language about fossil fuel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, is, is talking about um, a structure ancillary facilities used to move fossil fuel from one location to another. Um, it probably needs to be clarified, but um, I think I, I took it to mean that it did not include distribution lines. I, I took it differently, and, and um, I didn't, Ellen and I did not write this bill, it was kind of over the mention. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, sponsor's intent was. Mm -hmm. So that'd be if you take up the bill, you can decide yeah. if you mm -hmm. want to limit it or have it broadly, and yeah. we can clarify that language. I read it as more broadly. So okay. I don't know if that was intentional. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we were to allow distribution lines, which I think we should, um, we would have to carve out the ancillary facility that would uh, drop down the pressure for distribution. Yep. I, if that's your intent, yeah, I would suggest yeah. you be very clear and have a carve out if that's what you wish to do. I think I think this language can be read broadly. So if you don't want that, we should clarify it. Any questions about H fifty one? I wanted to more quickly uh, focus on two other bills that take a slightly different approach. To some of the same issues. H175 is a shorter bill, and it, in essence, let me pull down. So, right now, um, utility or company can uh, use eminent domain under certain circumstances if they're constructing a pipeline. Um, this bill would prevent that. And so you see the language on lines 13 and below. It says, no corporation or company may condemn any property or right in order to construct or expand facilities or structures that would, and then under one, transport fossil fuel, under two, produce electricity, heat, or energy using fossil fuel. And then there's a definition of fossil fuel that's similar to the one I just gave. So in essence, this is not this is not an absolute ban on fossil fuel infrastructure or pipelines, but it takes away one tool that is sometimes used to build a pipeline or, or structure eminent, eminent domain. So it would make it more difficult to build a new pipeline in Vermont. Um, Any questions? Yeah, I know nothing about eminent domain. Neither do I. So, okay. so I, missed, I missed that day in law school. In fact, I missed law school. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we can touch on that now. On, on all these bills, if you're taking one of them up, we can always yeah. research issues or get folks in here and give you more information. About it. So. Finally, I'd like to discuss H214. So this is, uh, in essence, modifies or adds criteria that the Public Utilities Commission would apply in considering whether to grant 
the certificate of public good for a natural gas facility. So if we page down, this is once again 30 VSA 248, the law we looked at more than once. And the new language states that um, this is the section we talked about earlier that no company uh, can begin site preparation or commence construction as any natural gas facility. You'll see on line four, this is reorganized, but this is existing language. You need to get a CPG. But below that is a new language. Um, unless the Public Utility Commission first evaluates the percentage of greenhouse gas leakage that occurs from the extraction and transportation of the natural gas and determines that the adverse effects of that leakage on climate change are outweighed by the good to the state. So it's a new factor that the PUC must consider before granting a CPG. Then under small three, also evaluates the impact of groundwater contamination caused by the extraction of the natural gas in the region where the extraction is conducted and determines that those impacts are outweighed by the good to the state. So this is strengthening or adding to the criteria that should be considered in deciding whether to grant the CPG. The other new language is if you click to page three on lines 12 through 15, it states that the Public Utilities Commission shall not allow companies to finance the construction of a pipeline through rates beyond the useful lifetime of the infrastructure and shall not allow the construction costs to be securitized on other utilities uh, beyond the pipeline <coughs> infrastructure itself. And as the details about securitization of pipeline costs, I'm sorry, I can't give you information on that. That's one of the things we can research or have people come in to discuss. But the objective is that to make it more difficult to obtain a CPG. So, so I think the purpose of that particular clause is uh, if, if we anticipate that we're not going to be using fossil fuels uh, beyond 30 years, mm -hmm. And it's going to cost, and if if, uh, if in order to pay for the pipeline, it's going to take 60 years at current rates, that uh, that would be a disincentive for the Public Utility Commission to issue the CPG. Now, there are, those are the bills that are in this committee. Uh, I am not aware of another pipeline bill that would be in another committee. I don't know why it would be. There's a couple of bills in the Senate. One of them is a sister bill, I think it's at age 51. And there's another bill that would in essence, essence ban uh, pipelines in the state that is written a little differently. But that's the universe of bills out there dealing with fossil fuel pipelines. Um, can you describe a little bit about the precedent for state laws, uh, state decisions requiring input from out of the state is that a common thing? Like uh, this one specifically oh, says, oh. we've got to consider effects that occur elsewhere. Yeah. Um, is that a common thing for state law or? I, I, I don't know whether I can say it's common for state laws and in general, it, it's legal. Okay. It could require that, I, I, it's possible. But I don't know if it's common or not. Okay. I guess, I guess I wonder how easy it would be to evaluate the percentage of greenhouse gas leakage um, and and also whether that would be variable depending on uh, the facilities being used at, the, at that moment or you know, the, the, the wells being used at that moment or the pipelines being used. I think those are implementation questions. Same with groundwater contamination, yeah. yeah. It, it seems like that might be difficult to establish. I, I don't know. Yeah, how difficult or not difficult. Can I make a general statement sure. on a lot of these bills? Um, I think we're naive in the thought that there's not something else out there that uh, natural gas or other extensions could be used for. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is the possibility, and they did look at it, for a new natural gas facility at the old Vernon 
nuclear power plant because all the infrastructure is there. My understanding is that there was an issue with Massachusetts bringing that line up through, and that's why that kind of fell apart. But again, if something like this was in place, that could never happen. Another example is uh, the Lowell and Eden asbestos mines has a proposal now to remine the slag piles up there, and um, they were initially looking uh, to St. Albans, but they feared that the Act 250 process would not allow them to do so, so they're looking at Gorham, New Hampshire, and what they need to extract these minerals out of uh, those slag piles is a huge amount of heat, which would be natural gas. And the products that, that are used, now this is, you know, this is just an example, is uh, magnesium oxide and magnesium hydroxide, which is used as a fire retardant for cable insulation in high quality cars, submarines, the Airbus A380, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 2, uh, insulation, <laughs> plastic, roofing on the London Olympic Stadium. You know, again, I'm just using it as an example that, you know, that's just one thing in my mind that I know in my area that could use natural gas for an unbelievable purpose for a product that's, that's needed. I mean, the, the project that they're proposing in Gorham is millions and millions of dollars. There's a facility in Canada now that does it, so it's not a pipe dream. It's not like something that doesn't happen. It can it can happen. You know, they have, they have EPA approval already to move the stuff. Mm -hmm. There's just other things that would have to uh, come down the pike. So, again, just in general terms of, of th those are two things that I can think of that should be thought about. And I'm sure there's other things out there that that could come about in the next few years that if we go down this road. Uh, would, would, I think, harm our abilities to to create things like this. I'm just curious, um, uh, just out of interest, in terms of the uh, the um, reclamation project in Lowell, uh, the, the uh, I don't want to call it mining, but it's really kind of reclamation. Um, would a pipeline be necessary in order to um, be a be transmission the, pipeline? It, yeah. It, it, it sounds like it would be unfeasible to get it from wherever it is now to the mines itself. That's why they're looking at <coughs> that St. Albans, but Gorham, New Hampshire was more viable uh, prospect to get, get the material over there. Because there's a pipeline there. Because there is a pipeline there. And it's, uh, they were looking at it to, uh, once they moved it and went into this facility, there would be, you know, be no more, there would be no airborne product or whatever, I guess. Once this is incinerated, there's virtually nothing left. Because I was thinking, geez, if you've got these huge slag piles, there's still going to be a, you know, a <coughs> mining operation or a slag pile still left. But I guess it, it burns it right down on the still open. Pretty, hmm. pretty interesting stuff. But anyway. Would that be good use for the extra Shia energy? Uh, it could be. <laughs> Toasters. I'm sorry? Toasters. Toasters. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was just wondering about the air quality uh, effects of actually <coughs> transporting what you got there in Lowell <laughs> to wherever it needs to go, whether it's in Gorham or whether it's uh, uh, closer. Uh, that actually picking up this stuff is going to probably create a lot of airborne. Well, there's a whole process that they worked into place of spraying it while it's being moved onto the trucks. So we supposedly got it down. Just again, it's, then, it's a mineral The question is, can, can, it be, can, can a distribution line serve the purpose of actually being the plant as opposed to a transmission line? <coughs> distribution line for the actual mineral itself? For the, the uh, plant, yes, plant, actual plant. Plant. Oh, Again, that's. I think they they must have considered that to some degree because that's not the direction they're they're headed in as far as you know they're, they're thinking it's cheaper to transport the stuff, which which again is a concern just because it was like 17 truckloads a day uh, from April to November I think it was they tried to stay out of the winter months. 
just just something to think about. Okay. Thank you, Luke, for sure. uh, taking us through these things. No, um, before we adjourn for the day, I just wanted to remind people about the um, the EV uh, demonstration um, event that's going on uh, near the Department of Labor tomorrow. It's four to six. I'm not going to be there because I already own one. Um, but I can uh, I can attest to my satisfaction with my electric vehicle. But um, if you have a chance at the end of the day tomorrow to go over that. Yeah. Do you want to follow up on any of the bills we discussed at this point? Uh, not, not immediately, but um, yeah, we will definitely pull you in as we get. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not going to talk to anybody that are going to that uh, EV demonstration there, but uh, we got the Turkish Cultural Center tomorrow. <laughs> that's <at> true. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody wants some baklava, that's where you get it. <laughs> so um, tomorrow we start at 9 o'clock, uh, and we have uh, two, here, uh, two different topics in the morning. And I'm not sure how much time we're going to have in the afternoon. Right now we don't have anything scheduled after the House floor. Um, and if it's late today, which I expect it to be, uh, I expect we'll be on the floor for two or three hours. Um, but at this time we don't have anything after the House floor. Thank you. Thank you.